Amad Aleph. Amad Aleph, yeah, because Echkolim is made up of many different chapters, and uh, they're short chapters, very short. So already three blot into the Masechta, you're already on <laughs> in the second chapter. You know, you're already on, uh, in, you know, in Perik Sheni, or uh, almost the end of Perik Rishon, I should say. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is called Mitzarfin Shkolim, and uh, the mission is going to talk about the case where they collected the Shkolim in a local town, and now they have to bring it bring it up to Yushalayim. So the Mishnah says, Mitzarfin Shkolim. In other words, they're allowed to exchange Shkolim. And Shkolim, if you have many small coins, it's a real hassle to transport them to Shalim. So Mitzarfin Shkolim means they can do what's called a money exchange. And they make it into Darkonos which are larger golden coins. In order to make it easier to carry and transport the shkola, the massive amount of shkola that they collected in a local, a local city or a local town. So I have here a comment from the Teferis Yisrael. He's like, because, you know, you shall, this is Yushalmi, therefore the Teferis Yisrael as a commentary on the Mishnah becomes very important. And he says that the Chiddush of our Mishnah is Afsha Gaboim Yerushalayim Yachzuru V'yifritu L'madbeos K'tanos. He says it's a very strange kind of thing. They're collecting smaller coins. They're converting it into larger coins only to convert it again into smaller coins when they reach the hands of the, of the Gizborim, the Gaboim in Yerushalayim. Now, every time that you make an exchange, you have to pay a fee to the money exchanger, to the Shulchani or the Chenvani, so that now the Hegdesh is really losing. They're losing on both ends. They first have to pay the Dmei Shulchani to convert the smaller coins into larger coins, and then when they get to Shalayim, Hegdesh is again going to suffer a loss because the Gizbar once again is going to have to pay a fee in order to convert the larger coins into smaller coins. And the Chiddush is that you're allowed to make this, uh, this exchange. And another point is that you can only make this exchange to currency, but not to Margolios, meaning the Gemara is going to explain that you cannot take the Shkolem and buy expensive, uh, precious, uh, let's say, uh, uh, pearls or other commodities, it, it must remain in calcul in currency. That's called uh, darkonos. Darkonos means larger currency. Now, he quotes here one of the Rishonim, Rabbeinu Meshulam, who writes, Konim zehuvim sheyochalo licham b'shimur. And the question is, what is exactly the meaning of Yochel Lohlichan Bishimur? It's possible, he says, that what he means is that the Rishus in the hands of the Gaboim is only Litzarif Hashkolim. And the Chiddush of the Mishnah is that the Gaboim are obligated to do so because of Masu Yader, because of the hassle of transporting these shkolim to shalayim because the smaller coins can get lost and it's much easier to hold on to the larger coins. So it comes out that the coin to Rebbein Meshulam by adding yachol alicham b'shimur means that since he has the potential of transporting them in a way that they'll be protected, then we're adding the therefore, which doesn't actually get spelled out by Rabbi Meshulam, but therefore they're obligated to do this. This is not just a license, but rather an obligation. Now, as I said before, this is only the second parak of Tshkolim. Later on, uh, in the sixth parak of Tshkolim, we're going to learn about 13 shofros. In the Beis Amigdash, there were the shofros. Shofros doesn't really mean a shofar, in the sense of a of an instrument, the shofar means 
that to collect and hold on to the coins, they had something that was wide on top and more narrow as it went as it went down. And that's where they placed the moats. It was called the shofar because it looks like a shofar. It's wide on one end and it gets narrow on the other end. Now, if they would stand it up with a wide end on top, then it would almost be impossible for the coins to fall through in the bottom because the bottom was narrow. So what they did was they turned it upside down and it was more narrow on top and wider on the bottom. Now, what that accomplished was that the Ramayim, you know, the swindlers, so to speak, would not be able to put their hands inside these coin uh, receptacles because they were so relatively narrow on top that they couldn't put their hands in. If they were wider on top, they could put their hands in. Also, by putting the, the uh, more narrow section of the chauffeur on top, they would be able to put in the mows, put the money in, and then it would fall down and collect on the bottom of this uh, basket or receptacle. And the mission establishes that the Gaboyim who are collecting the Shkolim, wherever they are, anywhere in the cities of Israel, would have to imitate what went on in the Migdash for the security and the protection of the Shkolim. And they would also have to set up Shofros. And as we said before, that was a matter, that was a way of protecting against the Ramoyim. And then after the shofros were filled up, they would gather together all the coins and they would convert them into a larger coin and, and carry that up to Yushalayim. Now, when it says, Kishem Shahayu shofros b'migdash, this is an issue as to whether or not the collection of the Shkolem was actually in the Migdash. And that's a gigantic uh, machlokis. The, the word Migdash here, according to the least Ramam Shita, is Yushalayim. So we would read it like the following, according to the Ramam. Kishem shal Yushofros bi Yushalayim, kacha Yushofros bi Medina. Medina meaning any city outside Yushalayim. Because the Ramam Shita is that the collection of the Shkolem was done in Yerushalayim, but not in the Beis HaMikdash itself. The Me'iri also seems to agree that Migdash means Yerushalayim. But the strange thing is that the Me'iri himself here in our Mishnah says that the word Migdash means literally the Beis HaMikdash. The Mishnah continues, B'nei Ha'ir, Shesholchu es shikleyam v'nignavu o she'ovdu. Now the question is, who is responsible in the case of a loss or a theft of the shkolim on their way to Yerushalayim? And you know, the members of the city find out that their, their monies that they contributed were stolen, were lost after the Gizbarim, you know, the money collectors had already received their money. So now the question is, at what point did it get lost? The Mishnah says, Im Nitrima Hatruma, if it was stolen or lost after the Gizbarim already brought and contributed the monies into the Lichka in the Beis HaMikdash, what's called the Trumas HaLichka, then Nishvayim like Nishvayim, there were the uh, carriers, or when I was a youngster, we used to call them runners. Does that word mean anything to you? Runners? Anyway. Yeah, I, yeah, what's we call it? Yeah, when, um, I was, when I was 16 years old, I got a job in the summer as a runner on right. Wall Street, you know, carrying uh, documents back and right. forth. So anyway, these are called the shlichim and the gizbarim are responsible. So now they, they have a claim, a lawsuit, so to speak, against the shlichim. And they say, wait a minute, you know, did you, were you negligent and you failed to protect the 
Shkolim on your way to Yerushalayim. Why is it that uh, I'm getting a message here? I got an email that it was lost. So in this case, you have a tovea and a nitba. You have a litig- you have two litigants. One is a plaintiff and one is a defendant. And the gizbarim, because they're the first first online, you know, to get sued, so to speak, for this loss, they become the plaintiffs, and the shlichim become the defendants. And the shlichim now have to take a shvua, which is what's called the shvua sashomrim. That's the shvua doraisa, and they have to testify through their shvu about two different things. Number one, lo pasha, and number two, lo shalach bayat, meaning we didn't use the, uh, the coins, these currency for our own purposes, because a shalach yad v'vikonon is automatically chayev, even if an onus happens later on. And the same is true for a shomer that was poshia, if he was negligent in his basic obligation to provide shmira, and he has to pay for any loss or any theft. So it comes out that the trumas hagizbarim, the truma that's given to the gizbarim, is actually uh, a truma on behalf of all of Israel. And whether or not the shkolim have arrived in Yerushalayim or haven't arrived, the gizbarim are playing the role of representing Klal Yisrael. And Everybody has a desire to gain a partnership in what's called the Karbana Satsibu. So these trumos, these gifts of Matzah Shekel, were given on behalf of every Jew so that he, every Jew, could have a partnership in the Karban Tzibu. Now, the Gizbarim, when they collected the Shkolim, they already was Zoha, they made an acquisition on the Truma. And it's as if the Beis Hamigdash, or we'll call it Hegnesh, already has acquired ownership over the Shkalim the very moment that they were collected by the Gizbarim. So it means that it's as if immediately after the Maisa Truma, the Maisa, what we call Shikul, automatically the monies are acquired by Hegdesh. And it's as if it came into the hands of Hegdesh. So therefore the loss now is going to be, in, in the case of theft or, or, or Aveda, it's going to be suffered by Hegdesh. And therefore the Gizbarim, insofar as they represent Klal Yisrael, they become the plaintiff, the baldin, to be tovea, to put forth a claim against the shlichim, against the runners. And this is all under the assumption that the Bnei Ha'ir, those who contributed, they got wind of the fact that the monies were taken on their way to Yerushalayim, and in love, let's say the Bnei Ha'ir who donated these monies, um, in love, and now the words in love, he quotes here in my commentary, the, um, the Rash Soleo, that's the super commentary on Yerushalmi, and he says that in love shall no Dele Bnei Ha'ir al Gnei Kodem Chinitrama Truma Vadain Lozocha Hegdish Bishkolim. So now what happens is that the Gizbarim have not yet have not yet acquired ownership on behalf of Hegdish, and already the Shkolim were lost or stolen. So that's called Adayin Lo Zoha Hegdesh Bishkolim. Now the law changes. Why? Because instead of the Gizbar being the Tovea, because he's representing Klal Yisrael, he's saying, wait a minute, you know what? I was Zoha on behalf of Klal Yisrael. Let's have, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of one Gizbar. And now the Shlichim have not 
successfully fulfill their obligation and uh, presented the Shkolim to, to the Beis Amigdash. But now the Shvua of the Shlichim is to the Gizbar. But in a case where the Gizbar did not even get a chance to do the Zchia, we have to figure out why they didn't do the Zchia. Now in such a case, Nishvoyim Libnei Ha'ir, the claim now, the plaintiff is now the Bnei Ha'ir. When the Gizbar had already been Zoch on behalf of Hegdesh, so the Bnei Ha'ir are out of the picture. They already delivered their Shkolim to Hegdesh. They fulfilled their obligation. Now the Gizbar becomes obligated vis-a-vis the Beis Migdash to deliver the goods. And lo and behold, the goods are not there. The Shkolim are not there. They got lost. They got stolen. So therefore the Gizbar comes and he's Tovea the Shliach. The Shliach has to take a Shvua. But in a case where the Gizbar did not acquire ownership on behalf of Hegdesh, now the plaintiffs are the Bnei Ha'ir. Why? Because they never filled their, fulfilled their obligation. Because the money was never transferred into the ownership of the Hegdesh. And therefore they now are the plaintiffs who will be Tovea. They'll put forth a claim against the Shluchim. And in event that the shluchim will take this shvua, shalopasha, shalopayad, then the Mishnah says, ir shoklim They have to have to replace the machzis shekel with another machzis shekel. They weren't yotze with the first machzis shekel because in this second scenario, in the sefer, the gizbar had not yet acquired ownership on behalf of Hegdesh. So the monies never came into the possession of Hegdesh. There was never a fulfillment of the mitzvah of Shkolim. Now, what happens if they find the Shkolim? So the Bnei Ha'ir now gave twice. Once, and the monies were never received. And the second one as a replacement for the coins, the Shkolim that were never received. And now they locate the first set of Shkolim. And in Kudshin, that's like a classic scenario. Like in, you may remember that we discussed what's about a carbon Pesach that was designated, then it got lost. They replaced it, and then they found the original carbon Pesach. Oh, another alternative scenario is Shech Zirom HaGanovim. That the Ganovim were found. Or well, miraculously, they did shuva and they offered to return the stolen shkolim. Maybe they were afraid that they'd get caught red-handed, so they might as well come forward. Is what's the status of the second set of shkolim? The first set of shkolim certainly are shkolim, and the Mishnah's mechadesh that elu v'elu shkolim. Even the second set of replacement shkolim are also sanctified with the kedusha of hegdesh. Because the donors were madnish those shkolin. And there's nothing to remove that status of hegdish. The ain't olam lahem lishona bo. Now you might say, well, look, I gave twice a half a shekel. Let at least it count on my account for next, next year. Why do I have to give next year if I gave you twice this year? No, the Mishnah says, ain't olam lahem lishona bo. And next year, they're going to have to give, again, a machzis shekel a second time around. Now, the Rush, who wrote a commentary on Shkolim, he writes, Mefaresh b'yuma, he quotes the Gemara, Nimesech the Yom Adaf Samach Hei, Ha, Lefisha ein chobos shona zu karban l'shona bo. Every year, the law was that they bought a new set of Karbanas Tzibur for that year from the Trumas Alishka, and any monies that are in Trumas Alishka from last year cannot be used to purchase the Karbanas of this year. Every year is a separate entity. The Rashas, that's Rav Shlomo Sirleo, he writes, Da aschu b'nei ha'ir b'neihem da tayu hu Interesting. This is kind of like what we call an umder of hefker. 
even in certain cases when I do have a claim, if there's an umdana and it's quite clear that I dropped my claim, I waived my claim, then I cannot come back and claim. So the Rosh Sirleo interprets that Mishnah saying that the people, once they gave the second round of Maksa Shekel to replace the first round, they were Mesich Das, meaning they dropped that claim and they said, you know what? I'm sending it to Hegdich. I don't expect to get any uh, rebate. And therefore, the second round is also Hegdich. All right, now we start the Gemara. Now, the Mishnah says that because of Masri Haderech, we're allowed to, and perhaps even obligated to, convert smaller coins into larger coins. So Gemara says, Vyasa also Margolios. I have a better idea, the Gemara says. Instead of going to the money changer and spending extra fees for his commission, why not just buy with these shkolim precious stones? And they're very small, very easy to transport. The Mishnah seems to say that we only can use currency, only my tails. Why is that so? Now, the big issue here, are we dealing with the Doraisa halacha or is it all Drabonon? If it's Drabonon, then we're just simply trying to get the best results. And the Gemara thinks in, if you want to get the best results, it seems like the easiest way of achieving our goal and engineering the transport of the Shkolem is by converting them into precious stones. What's the purpose? What's the purpose of that? Well, so again, we have to protect these these monies. It's massive amount of, of masa right. shekel. You, you would need bags and bags. I mean, it would be even more that than Santa be... Claus and his reindeer. They couldn't carry it. So right. what so they needed to was carry. to convert it into yeah. either larger coins, right. or the Gemara suggests a better option. Why not just buy earrings or, you know, Margolios right. Tovos, right. and then sell them when you get to Shalim to buy the masa shekel? Right. The Gemara says that's not a good idea. Why? Shema Tazil. We're worried about fluctuation and devaluation. In other words, market value of precious stones or pearls fluctuates quite, is quite sensitive to fluctuations in the market. And into Hegdesh Mafsu, we don't want to put Hegdesh into this precarious situation where they might take a loss. The pearls were worth more at the time of the purchase than they are now when they get to Uchalayim and you have to sell them in Uchalayim. Right. Now, there's another possible element here. It could be that the pearls are worth more in the smallest cities than they are in the bigger cities, because in the bigger cities, there's more competition. The law of supply and demand. Now, the Gemara wants to bring a proof that there is such a fear, halachically, in devaluation on the market of pearls and things of that sort. Yeah, he saninon tamon, like a Mishnah that we learned in Mesechta Bechoros. And very often in this Mesechta Shkolim, the Gemara compares and contrasts sometimes Shkolim to Bechor, right? If you own a flock of, a herd of animals and they're kosher animals, then the first Petar Rechem has to be given to the Kohen. And there's an entire Mesechta dedicated to that called Bechoros. And the Mishnah says in Bechoros, V'kulon niftim b'kesef, u'b'shava kesef, chutz mishkolin. That although any Bechar or Hegdesh under certain conditions lends itself to what's called Pijon, and you can depot it both onto coins, currency, that's called Kesef Matbeos, or Shava Kesef, or commodities of value like Metaltolin, because we have a principle called Shava Kesev Kekesev, but the Mishnah explicitly excludes Shkolim. In the case of Shkolim, you can only be Poder redeemed Shkolim with Matbeos and not with Shava Kesev. And that would exclude Matbe that would exclude Margolios. So the Gemara asks the following Kasha. The ain podim 
why is it that you're not allowed, according to the Mishnah B'choros, to be Podesh Golim with Shavu Kesef, like Kalim? I'm not exactly sure why the Gemara switches its language from Margolios to Kalim. We'll see if we can we can uh, check that out. You know, when it comes to Shami, there's so many different Gersos. He writes on the bottom that the Gon, who o- always has a different Gersa, he takes out the words, the end code in the Kalim, because it says chutz mishkolim. So chutz mishkolim means that you cannot be pod mishkolim with shavu kesef. And the Gemara is asking, why not? Amar Rab Shmuel bar Rabbi Yitzchak, shema yazilu hakelim, because we're afraid of a devaluation in the market of commodities. Any commodity might go down in value. Benimza hegdish mafsid, and ofachenami. And therefore, we're going to apply the same logic in explaining our Mishnah. Why aren't we Mitzaref into Margolios, Shemataza Margolios, Benimtza, Hahegdesh, Mafsid? So the same logic that Rav Shmuel applies to Kalim, we're going to apply to Margolios. And that's called Shemiyaz Zilu. Now, if we learn Mesechta Bob Mitzia, Perkazov, we'll see that even currency goes down in value. You could have currency that's gold and silver. And in the commodity market, silver and gold can fluctuate in its value. So by the same token that you're worried about Hegdish losing money when you convert the shkolim into commodities like Kalim or like Margolios, the same fear and the same, the same possibility right. should exist even in the case of currency. Currency also goes up and down. However, the Gemara does assume in Bab Metzia, that there are certain currencies that pretty much remains, remain uh, s- steady. No, not steady. What's the word I want to say? R- remain uh, that are reliable in their in their value. Like they stay on par. They stay on par. They stay on par, par basically. Right. Like. For example, you know, in uh, Perkazov, the halacha is that. Um, that there's an Issa Ribis. Let's say I lend you money and I want to collect the same currency as repayment of the loan. And now we have to consider that that currency either went up in value, went down in value, and then I'm, I might be overcharging you or undercharging you. Maybe I'm getting Ribis. So the Gemara says that, let's say, for example, it could be sil- silver coins will be valuated in comparison to gold coins. It means the gold coins are considered like sudar. Sudar means, you know, a a flat value that doesn't fluctuate. So now the Mishnah tells us that just like in the Migdash they had Shofros, so too in Medina they require Shofros. So the Gemara says, Masnisa, our Mishnah that requires Shofros in Medina, that's only Betiklim Chadatim. These are new Shkolim that were recently minted. Let's say, for example, the month, the key month for Shkolim is the Adar, right? On Rosh Hosh Adar, that's when they started collecting the Shkolim. So if the Gneva took place in Adar for the next year's Shkolim, the next year starts on actually today on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So these are Taklin Chadatim. And in such a case, the Mishnah requires Shofros. Avol Taklin Atikin, if the Shkolim are old Shkolim and is low bida. In other words, there were no shofros in the Medina for old shkolim. If somebody owed money from previous years, he would have to bring them personally to the base Hamigdash. 
the city Gizbarim, the local Gizbarim in the towns and the villages throughout Israel were not in charge. It was not their responsibility to collect old obligations, old debts of Shkolim that were not paid off. And therefore, a person who owes an old Chiyuv shekel from a year before, he's personally responsible to bring it to the Migdosh. And for Tony Kane, that's what we saw in the Bryson. Atikin be Migdosh, the Ein Atikin be Medina. They had special shofros in, in the Migdosh, which again might be Yerushalayim in the Migdosh, for a collection of old shkolen that were brought to the Migdosh, but not in the Medina. Atikin, the older coins from previous years were not collected in the Medina. As we said before, you'd have to bring them personally to Yerushalayim. Okay, now let me just take a minute here to read following note here. If you have, you you have the English? No, actually, I don't have the article. Well, just, I'll, I'll very quickly, it. if you don't mind, I'm going to read the footnote. There's a yeah, very yeah. long footnote. Yeah, read the gives, footnote. Yeah, yeah. It gives us a, a little bit of a background. Um, and he says the following. He says, Shkolim were, were withdrawn three times per year for the purchase of sacrifices. One is before Pesach, the other before Shavuos, and the other before Sukkot. And before each withdrawal, the administrators, meaning the Gizbarim, would remove the coins from the collection chests in the Migdash and place them together with the coins which arrived through the messengers from all the various Jewish communities throughout Israel, near and far. And that was brought into a special chamber on the temple grounds. Fine. Now, the purpose of the shekel contribution was to give every Jew a share in the Karbonos Tzibur, he calls them communal office offerings. And Every Jew gained a share in these karbonos by donating his machzis shekel. Okay, that's something that we discussed already. And now he says the following. In regard to a firstborn son and Hegdesh, the only restriction regarding their redemption is that they may not be redeemed onto avadim, shtaros, or karkos, but they may be redeemed onto other items that are worth money, such as utensils. But in the case of shkolim, they cannot be redeemed onto utensils. And why? Because of the concern that the value of the pearls might be devaluated. The value of minted gold coins relative to silver tends to be stable. Oh, that's the word I needed, stable. Yeah, I couldn't uh, come up with that word. Therefore, gold coins may be used for shkolem exchanges. Now, two of the 13 collection chests that stood in the chatzar, in the temple courtyard, were reserved for the yearly shkolem. And these two chests were labeled, one was labeled as new shkolem, and the other is old shkolim. Anyone who contributed his shekel during Adar, which is supposed to, what, that's what he's supposed to do, his shekel was deposited in the shofar, the chest that was marked new shkolim. Anyone who for whatever reason did not contribute a shekel during the month of Adar, he was still required to contribute and his contribution would be placed in a different shekel, a different box, that was marked old shkolen. He says, the truma salishka, which as we mentioned earlier, was performed three years, three times a year before the three regolim, shkolen that were contributed after the first truma would be added to the lishka and would be used during the second truma. And shkolen that were contributed after the second truma would be added to the Lishka, and they could be used to buy Karbonus for the third Truma. So these were the three cutoff points during the course of the calendar year. If someone did not contribute his, his Shekel, neither before Pesach nor before Shavuos, even 
before Sukkot, he missed the, the deadline, which the last deadline was before Sukkot. He missed the chance of having his shekel being used for that year's carbon seaboard. He was still obligated to come forward with his contribution of a chatzit shekel. And then his shekel was placed, as we said before, in the chest that was marked Old Shkolem Atikin, and the Shkolem in that chest would be added to whatever coins remained in the Lichka after the last Truma was separated before Sukkot. So you have what's called Mosar HaShkolem, and those are left over Shkolem past Sukkot. They would be combined together in the same shofar with Last, if, if somebody didn't give and the final uh, deadline passed, meaning Sukkot, and now he's giving for last year, they put those two together. And those coins were called Chiyari Alishka. They were used for other needs, not for Karbonus Tzibur, such as to repair the city walls. So Agamar is saying that although chests were set up throughout the provinces, these chests, these shkolim, were set up only exclusively for shkolim, from which, after being delivered to, to Shalayim, were bought, used for purchase, earmarked for pur- purchase of Karbonus Tzibur. No collection chests were provided in provinces for the old shkolim. The sole chest for old shkolim stood in the Chatzer, in the Mishkan, in the Migdash, and people who did not contribute that shkolem until after the deadline of sukkahs were compelled to bring the payments and remit them to the temple itself. Okay. So again, Masnisa, the Bryce says, Bitkolim chadetin aval bitkolim atikim lo. Ida. Fine. He gives a whole list of marmakomas here. It is apparent that the Rambam in Hilfus Shkol and Perk Beis says that the two chests stood in each of the provinces, one for new Shkol and one for old Shkol. He must have had a different uh, Yushalmi than what we have. Okay. Now let's talk about the responsibility on a financial, on a, on a monetary basis of the, of the Shomrim, excuse me, of the Shlichim, I mean to say, And we said that the Bnei Ha'ir that sent their shkolim and they were stolen or lost, then the shluchim have to take a shvua to the gizbarim. So Masnisa, the din of our Mishnah, shluchim have to take a shvua, otherwise they're not potem ilsham, they're, they're actually held responsible to pay out of pocket. That's b'shomer chinam. Avo b'shomer sachar, we don't even give them the option, the luxury of taking a shvua, because a shomer sachar, who's being paid for a shmira, is chayav in gneva ve'aveda. I wouldn't want to be a shomer, even if I'm being paid for it, because this is a very tricky business. I might be chayav an awesome sum of money, we can even interpret the Mishnah in a case where the Shluchim are being paid and nevertheless they are allowed to take a Shvua and be Potur because what does the Mishnah mean when it says Mignavu is Belistim Mizuya. The law is that if armed robbers would come and steal something, then it's Shomer Sachar is potter in that case. In other words, a Shomer Sach is potter for Onsim, and Listim Izuyam is classified as Onsim, armed robbers. Or Aveda, Higon, it could be a case of Tava Svinosa Bayam. Imagine they took a boat from the north, you know, coming down towards the south to Yerushalayim. I mean, again, they have to bank the, but the ship sank. And that's called onus. And the Shomer Socha could not have done anything to prevent that. He did everything that he was required to do. He provided the exact protection for the 
for the currency that he was meant and obligated to provide within the context of the Shmira. And therefore, he's part of Yilashalim. This is already an onus. So Gineva in our Mishnah could be referring to a list of Mizuya and Aveda to Tavas Vinos of Yam. And in these cases, he takes a Shvua, Shalo Shalach Yad, and he takes a Shvua that they were stolen by an armed robber, and he is part of Yilashalim. Now, in the footnote here, he quotes the Karbona Eva, who is the super commentary on Yushalmi. He says that there's another Girsa that says just the opposite. Masnisa Bishomer Sacha, Avo Bishomer Chinam Lo Bada. In other words, in the case of Bishomer Chinam, he's part of Bishomer Sacha. Since he would be Chayev, therefore he has to take a Shvua. Now, the Diyun in our Mishnah, regarding our Mishnah, is regard to a Shvua that applies to a Shliach who is demanding payment for his Shmira. He's a Shomer Sacha. And that's why our Mishnah is irrelevant in the case of Shomer Chinam. He has no claim for payment. He's not being paid. And the Gemara says that in the cases of Gnev of Aveda, the Shliach can only demand his payment, his schar for Shlichus, if he completed his Shlichus properly. But if it was stolen or lost, then he has no claim for schar. He doesn't have rights to claim payment. But Khan Ayri, the honest Gomer, the Gemara says, and the Shvua is it's a Bershuso, and it's Lo Shalat Boyad, and therefore he has rights to demand his payment according to the agreement of a Shomer Sacha. Now the Mishnah says that the Shvua of the Shomer is taken to the Gizbar, or alternatively to the Bnei Ha'ir. Omar of Yusti by Rabbi Simon. This din that if the truma in certain scenarios requires a shvua to the gizbar, that's because we see and we define the shkolim as if they already came into the rishus of Hegdesh. So the bnei ha'ir are no longer bali dinim. They don't have any claim anymore. They already fulfilled their obligation. And now the coins were stolen from Hegdish. But the, the Gizbar is now the Baldin because he represents Hegdish. Is Asya Kimandi Omar. This Mishnah, therefore, says Rav Simon, reflects the Shita of Tarmin ala Govui viala Osid Ligvos. Now, Tarmin. Alagovui means that when the Kohanim collect the Shkolim on behalf of the Truma Salishka, because they're the ones who ultimately will purchase the Karbonos, they collect on Govui, which means that even though the Shkolim have not yet been delivered to the Lishka, Nevertheless, the Kohanim are Tarmim es Halishka. Osid Ligvos. Even Shkolim that haven't yet been collected. And the reason for this is because Zoch and the Odom Shalobafana, meaning that there are Jews who are tardy, you know, they, they are delaying their contributions, but they too want to get an option of right. owning part of the Karbonus HaTzibur, so the Kohenim could go out and purchase the Karbonus HaTzibur on behalf of those who have not yet actually collected and contributed their Shkola. And that the purpose of this is hmm. Now, if this be the case, if Tarmim ala govim ala osid libos, nimtza in other words, the reason why 
once the coins, the shkolin, were delivered, were delivered into the hands of the shlichim, it's as if they came already into the Rishis of Hegdesh, it's because of this mechanism, this rule, which is called Tormen ala govu ala osid ligvos. Baram, one second, I'm not sure how to, um, we'll, we'll try to see. All right, we'll see if that can help. He says, Baram, he says, however, according to the Mandi Omar who holds that ain't term in Lola Govui Viala Asid Ligvos, in other words, that which hasn't yet reached the hands of the Truma Salichka, it hasn't been placed into the Truma, and it hasn't been collected yet, lo bida. Not according to this Shita can we interpret our Mishnah. Because according to that sheet of Ain Tarmin, then even if the contributions were already given to the Gizbarim in the various cities, but nevertheless, the Bnei Ha'ir have not yet contributed to Lichka Hatruma because the Kohanim have no right to, to acquire the monies of the Lichka Hatruma until it goes into the Truma. So therefore, the Shmur of the Shlichim would have to be to the Bnei Ha'ir because the Bnei Ha'ir would have, in, a, in effect, if they don't find and locate these Shkolen that were lost or stolen, then what's going to happen is they're going to have to replace these Shkolen with the second round of Shkolen. So Rav Yusti right. is now presenting a thesis that our Mishnah reflects the sheet of Tarmin al Gavui Val Cheino Gavui. And that's why the Bnei Ha'ir, once they contributed, they're off the hook because it's as if the collection has been already implemented on their behalf by the Kohen. But if you hold Ein Tarmin al Cheino Gavui, al Asid Ligmos, then clearly the Bnei Ha'ir are still in the Haxi, you know, they're still obligated to pay for the Shkolem in event that they're lost, and therefore the Shvua of the Shlichim would be a Shvua towards the Bnei Ha'ir. Right. Yeah. All right, let's see, can we, another few minutes? Okay, another few uh, minutes. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now the Mishnah says, "Bnei Ha'ir sheshalchu es shikleim v'nignavu o avdu im nitrum ha'truma nishbarim l'gizbarim im lav nishbarim l'bnei Ha'ir." So now the Gemara deals with the shvua of the shlichim. The Gemara asks, "We have a Mishnah in Masech the Shvuos that there's no such thing as a shvua on Hegdish. There are a number of categories of items that are mufka are completely excluded from shvua." Like a nishbon al karkos, a nishbon al hegdesh. So therefore, how do we understand that Mishnah that the shlichim are taking a shvua on hegdesh when the Mishnah establishes that a nishbon al hegdesh? Amar Rabbi Lazar, our Mishnah reflects the sheet of Rabbi Shimon. So this is called the Dovra Garim Lamamon Kimamon Dom, which means that if I am holding on to your Mamon, but I have a Chrayus such that if that Mamon is lost or stolen, I have to replace it, and I'm considered the owner of that Mamon. Like, for example, the Gemara says in Chametz, if, let's say, I deliver Chametz into the hands of a Shomer before Pesach, he will violate by Yorobai Matzik, because he has a Chrayis over the Chametz, such that he has to replace it in the event that it's lost. And if we apply that logic here to Kajim, 
So he has a chiv achrayus, which means that if the truma was not yet delivered, then the bnei ha'ir still have achrayus, as we said earlier, that they have to replace the shkolim and bring a second shekel instead of the first, if in event the shkolim never make it to Yerushalayim. And therefore, this is considered mamon hedjot, according to Rabbi Shimon. It's not considered purely mamon hegdish. Now, Rabbi Shimon is not denying the fact that this is hegdish and it belongs, it's owned by hegdish. He's just saying that there's another dimension to ownership, which is engendered by a chryos. Right. And that element and that dimension is enough to, ge- to generate a shmua. I can demand the shmua on this moment of Hegdesh because I have to replace this moment of Hegdesh through Achrayus in event that it's lost or stolen. So now I have a tvia, it's my money, because I'll have to replace this money with others. And therefore, I have a right to demand that the shliach take a shmua. And it's not considered nishma and ala Hegdesh. However, if we hold like the Rabbanon who reject Reb Shimon, and therefore, in the case of Achrayus, the money is purely 100% owned by Hegdesh and Amish Boyan Allah Hegdesh Klaam. And there's no way that we can reconcile our Mishnah, according to Rabbi Lazar, with the sheet of the Chachamim. We have no choice but to push an elephant through the eye of a needle and assume that our Mishnah could only be uh, reconciled or has to uh, be attributed, uh, reflect the sheet of Rabbi Shem. Um, Rabbi Yochanan disagrees. This is classic throughout the Yushalmi. It's always a machlokas between Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Lazar. Right, right. I mean, in, in the Bavli, very often you have Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lokish, but in the Yushalmi, it's much more frequent that you have Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Lazar. Even the Chacham who hold Einich Bon Al Hegdeshos and the Chosim Shechayim Bachur Yuson Hegdesh, it belongs to Hegdesh and not to you. You don't have private ownership. Nevertheless, there would be a Shvuah. Why? Mishum Shvuah's Takana He. Our Mishnah is not talking about a Shvuah Do Raisa, but rather a Takana's Chachamim instituting this Shvuah in order to protect. The interests of Hegdish. Imagine, you know, the Shluchim are carrying and transporting a massive amount of money of Hegdish. And if they can get away without a Shvua because Amy Chbon Allah Hegdish shows, then Hegdish is really vulnerable to suffer a tremendous financial loss. So the Rabbanan instituted a Shvua similar to the Gemara at the beginning of Bab Metziah, if you remember, about Shnaim Osa Batalis, that the Gemara finally concludes after about eight blot at the Shvua of the Mishnah. Of Zenish Bashen Libo Pachas Miyat Chetz Yosevet is all a Takonis Chachom. So there are many scenarios, many situations in which on a Doraisal level there is no Shvuah, but the Rabbanan insist on a Shvuah. The Gemara now is a Kasha on Rabbi El Lazar. Al Daite the Rabbi Yochanan Nicha. I understand that Mishnah, <coughs> if the Shvuah is only a Takonis Chachom. In other words, in a case where the truma was already acquired by Hegdish, and now the Gizbar is in the hot seat, as we called it before, right? He's the one who's now responsible. So in such a case, the Shlichim have to take a Shvua to the Gizbar. That I understand. But in Lav, if on the other hand, the truma was not actually delivered and it was lost on the way, then is Bain Lubnea ear. Why? Why did the Bnei ear have the status of the plaintiff to demand the Shvuah from the Shlitim? Because Bnei ear Shoklim Acherin, because they will have to replace the Shkalim Tachtehem here on the top of the Fehemid base, and they have to replace the Shkalim that were lost. And in all these cases, Mishum Shvuas Takana. Elo le Rabbi Elazar, he interprets that mission according to Rabbi Shimon. So, okay, if we can understand that if lo nishma truma nishba in libnei ha'ir, adah he, this 
section of the Mishnah could be understood to Rabbi Shimon. Then it makes sense, according to Rabbi Shimon, that since the B'nai Ira Chai Bachrayus, because we're talking the case of low Nitrima Trumason, then Nishboy Mashlichim Aleim, because it's not Momon Hegdesh in its entirety, it's not purely Momon Hegdesh, it also belongs to the Bailim, they'll have to replace it. And so Nishboy and Ligizboran. Oh, but now we get to the case of the Shvua, in the case with Nitrima Shvua, Nitrima Truma. And then the mission establishes that the Shluchim have to take in such an event a Shvua to the Gizbarim. Gizbarim Maya Why? Why should the Shluchim have to take a, they're obligated to take a Shvua to the Gizbarim? I mean, the Shkola right. don't belong to the Gizbarim. And now it belongs to Hegdish. And Rabbi Shimon holds, I mean, the Mishnah says that Einish bar not like Deishas. So Bishlam, if the Bnei Ha'ira is still on the firing line because Adayin Odlo Nishram Atrumasam, then I understand the Shvua because it's private ownership and it's not purely Hegdish. But in the case of Nishram Atrumasam, where the Mishnah shifts the Shvua over to the Gizbarim, it's Hegdish. There's no Shvua on Hegdish. According to Rabbi Lazar, our Mishnah can only work out with Hegdish. So the Gemara answers that you're right. Einishbon is since Einishbon are like Deshos, <clears throat> there cannot be a Shvu on Hegdesh. But Al Mishnah is talking about a case of a Shliachus, a Shomer Sachar. He was being paid for a Shliachus, and the Shkola was stolen or lost in such a case that he shouldn't be able to claim payment for Hishmira because he never actually delivered the goods. So let's say <coughs> the Shluchim want to claim it was stolen with Lusta Mizuya, or they claim that the boat sank and therefore Ba'ones they could not deliver the Shkolim and they're not Chayv at all. Now the Shluchim have a right to claim from the Bnei Ha'ir their schar as a Shomer Socha, that was the contractual agreement, is Nishboim Libnei Ha'ir. They take a Shvua to the Bnei Ha'ir that they're not holding on to the Shkolim, they didn't pack, pocket the Shkolim. And now, this Shvua becomes a B'maimad Gizbarim, which if I understand correctly, B'maimad Gizbarim means in the presence of the Gizbarim, Ki Shadinu, so the Gizbarim should not suspect the Shluchim of holding on to the Shkol and they stashed it away somewhere in a, you know, in a safe. Inami Delo Nashvulu Poshim. They shouldn't think that the Shluchim were laid back and they were uh, irresponsible about their Shluchus. So let me just um, read to you what he says here in the footnote. He's saying... Sorry, I'm just shifting from one safer to the other, so sometimes it takes me a little time. He says the Mishnah means to say that the messengers, right, the Shluchim, who were paid, they were Shomer Sachar, they're swearing to collect their wages from the members of the town, because again, according to Rabbi Lazar, it's only when the Members of the town have a chrayus, that's when there's a shvua, because then it's Mamon Island, it's not Mamon Hegdesh. When the Mishnah says that if the truma was already withdrawn, then the messengers swear to the treasurers. What it actually means is they swear to the townspeople in the presence of the treasurers. So the true, if the truma has already been withdrawn at the time the coins were stolen, then when the messengers come to collect their wages from the townspeople by swearing to them that the coins were lost due to onus, they must swear to the treasurers, which means that the gizbar must be present at the time that the shluchim will take the shvua to the bnei ha'ir. The oath is taken to the Bnei Ha'ir, not to the treasurers, because the treasurers only represent Hegbej, 
and Rabbi Loz is applying the principle of English one al So now the Gemara is going to ask, so why do the why do the Gizbarim have to be present at the time of the Shavuot? Ki hechi delolech shedinu, inami delo nashvulu poshim. <laughs> so that the Gizbarim should not suspect the messengers of having stolen the coins because they hear the Shavuot. Alternatively, the reason the treasures must be present is so that they do not brand the messengers as negligent. They shouldn't be coaching them that they were negligent, they were potion. So he says, even if the treasurers would not suspect the messengers of having stolen the coins, they nevertheless might accuse the messengers of having been negligent regarding the Shmira. The treasurers must therefore be present when the Shomrim take the oath to the townspeople so that they'll be absolutely convinced that the loss of the coins was beyond the messenger's control to prevent it. So this is the Mishnah ruling for a case in which the Truma had already been withdrawn at the time of the mishap. Sorry. That's what happens when you forget to shut off your phone. <laughs> but okay, we'll finish up now. So he says, now the Gemara just adds one more line. He says, according to Rabbi Yochanan, that the Shavu is because of the Takanis Chachamim. So in a case where they, they weren't tarring the Truma, it wasn't withdrawn yet, and the Shliach has to take a Shavu to the Bnei Ha'ir, and the Bnei Ha'ir in that case will have to replace the Shkalim, so that chiyuv shvua afal pi shekiblu bnei ha'ir l'shalem, even though the bnei ha'ir believe the shliach, and they trust him, and they're willing, without any hesitation or any inhibition, to offer a replacement shkolim. Nevertheless, the shliach has to take a shvua, because that's the nature of the takonis chachamim. Ena hegdish yotze below shvua. In order to protect the interests of Hegdish, people shouldn't be mezalzel the Hegdish. And therefore, if they take upon themselves the responsibility as shluchim to transport the Hegdish and, and guard the, and safeguard the Hegdish, then they should know they're not going to get away, even if they can convince the people that they're honest and the people who are willing to waive the Shavu, but nevertheless, the Takhanas Chacham requires that they absolutely, under all conditions, take the Shavu. And the reason for that is <clears throat> they should realize the responsibility, the heavy weight that they've accepted upon themselves to deliver the shkolim and therefore provide the best, the best shmira for the shkolim. Okay then. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I wanted to read to you this footnote. He quotes Rashi Bab Metzia that calls Ebedafka in Kfar Nitrima Truma. Avol beima dain lo Nitrima Truma. Why? So that in a case of lo nitrima truma, where the bnei ha'ir are now responsible to replace it, in such a case then they don't have to take a shvua in front of, in the presence of the Gizborim, because there's no chashash here that the Gizborim would have uh, pocketed the shkolim or were negligent in the shmira, because what do they gain the Gizborim? Sharei ma ichpas le The Gizborim don't lose anything if they're off the hook and it's the Brea era on the hook and they're the ones who will have to Replace the shkolim with a second round of of shkol. Okay, then. So we got up to Hifrit Shiklo the Ovad, and this is where we'll stop. And thank you so much.